Hope you enjoyed that little video summary of the last series, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, Kingdom Stories and the Parables. Uh, uh, Catherine Tilly produces those for us. We appreciate that very much. Well, last week or so, uh, Jeff told me, Pastor Jeff told me, he had the unique privilege of doing a funeral. And the funeral was a privilege because it was for a lovely and godly woman named Lois Flora, who passed away at 96 years old. She and her husband Henry, who's 98, uh, had been married for 72 years. They've been at this church for, uh, for a number of years. Henry's still living, but he's unable to attend worship as much now due to his uh, health conditions. But in the process of doing that beautiful service, Jeff said Henry told him a story of serving in World War II in the Pacific Theater in the same fleet of ships commanded by General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, it tells you that great generation is still around, although we're losing them, but Jeff shared that with me, and that made me think uh, about General MacArthur. did a little research, and I, and, I, and I remembered a story, one of the most famous generals in U.S. history, and he's famous not just for winning a whole bunch of medals, which he did, including the Medal of Honor, but for making a, an audacious promise. And some of you who know World War II history know the promise. It, it took place in the darkest days of the war, 1942 or so, when he had been ordered by President Eisenhower to retreat from the Philippine Islands as the Japanese invaded. And MacArthur didn't like that order at all, uh, to retreat, but he had to obey the president, and he did. But as he left the Philippines, he announced rather brashly, I shall return, he said. And then some two years later, 1944, he did return, led a series of decisive and brilliant victories that turned the tide of the war in the Pacific. Now today, uh, we begin a new series, and I'm going to talk about another dramatic promise of return. But before do, we do that, I want to do a little more review than what the video was able to do. For the last nine months or so, beginning at the end of last August, our preaching theme has been the story of Jesus. And we started out with a series... Can anybody remember the name of the very first series we did in this series? I had to think about it too. It was called Anticipation. We looked back into the Old Testament to some of the prophecies about the coming of Christ, prophecies before Jesus was even born. And then we moved into a series called Preparation. We talked about the early life of Jesus from things like his, when he was left in the temple when he was 12 to his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Then we moved to a series called Going Public which began with the first miracle that sort of took Jesus into the public realm and he turned water into wine, the beginning of his public ministry. Then we took a break and went to the Christmas story and the Advent series was called Witnesses when we presented first-person monologues from characters in the great story of Jesus' birth. After the turning of the new year, we did a series on prayer called Teach Us to Pray, looking at Jesus' prayer life and what he taught us. Moved from there to a series called The Healer, as Jesus healed many, but the specific stories we looked at were the healing of a leper, the healing of a blind man, the healing of a paralytic, and then the healing of a dead man named Lazarus. Then we went to our Easter series, which was called Behold the Man, looking at the last week of Jesus' life, in particular focusing on his death and resurrection. And then our last series was called Kingdom Stories, which you saw in the video, The Parables of Jesus. And that brings us to where we are today in the story of Jesus, Return of the King, Jesus in the Book of Revelation. Now, the Book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible and is, in a sense, the last chapter in the story of Jesus. And it's a complicated and very fascinating book if you've ever tried to read it or study it on your own or in a group. But it's a book very often misunderstood and very often misused, I believe. I think it's helpful for us to start just by way of background by kind of establishing what Revelation is not about, okay? Revelation is not the revelation of when and how the world's going to end. Quite often, uh, the discussion goes that direction uh, because it's just sort of human nature and curiosity and inquiring minds want to know, but that's not the purpose of the book. Uh, it's not the revelation of the identity of the Antichrist, whether or not that person is part of our current political situation or not. I've heard, that's just a joke, by the way. Um, it's not about that. And it's important to say those things as we start because it's easy to get sidetracked into the spectacular images that are in the book of Revelation. Uh, the point is 
not to give us a timeline about when and how the end of all things will take place. Jesus himself said, you're not going to know the day and the hour of my return. So what is the book of Revelation all about? The formal title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Usually it's shortened down to Revelation. But the whole title is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. John, the writer, is recording a, a series of visions that Jesus gave to him, that Jesus revealed to him as he looked into heaven in sort of this spiritual vision. And I believe the whole message of the book of Revelation can be summarized in four short statements. I'll give them to you now and put them on the screen. First, human history is headed toward an end. Human history is headed toward an end. Now, that sounds like a no-brainer for most of us in Western culture. But you need to know there are a number of world religions and world cultures and belief systems that believe something different about time and history. They believe time is cyclical, that history moves in endless cycles that repeat themselves. You can see this kind of thinking in Buddhism, for example, in the karmic system of Hinduism, and in other ancient cultures like the Mayans, who believe the calendar is just kept spinning around like a great wheel. But Revelation teaches us that time is not cyclical. Time is linear. It moves in one direction from beginning to end. And Revelation points toward that end. Secondly, things are going to get better, or excuse me, things are going to get worse before they get better. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Now this might come as a shocker to you. But human beings are not evolving into more loving and compassionate creatures. They aren't. Civilization progresses in technology alone. Human nature does not change. Has not changed in five or 10,000 years. Technology changes, not human nature. Human civilization is not evolving into a more peaceful and utopian order. Just read the newspaper every day. Watch the news. Did you know right now there are major wars, and a major war is defined as more than 1,000 dead in one calendar year. There are major wars right now in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Turkey, Pakistan, Yemen, Sudan, Nigeria, and Ukraine at the least. And some think that list is a couple dozen more. We see violence perpetrated by terrorist groups almost on a daily basis, and we tend to think of ISIS, right? Al-Qaeda, maybe Boko Haram in Africa. But did you know the United Nations now lists 178 separate identifiable terrorist organizations in the world? 178. I believe an argument can be made that human civilization is not getting better. It's actually devolving into a more and more dystopian and violent state than almost any time in human history. Things are going to get better, uh, worse before they get better. I almost did it again. Third, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. In John 14, 6, Jesus himself said, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. In Acts 1, verse 11, after Jesus ascends into heaven, the disciples are standing around looking up and angels appear to them and say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. As Christians, we believe Jesus is coming back, first of all, because he promised to do so, and secondly, because God's word points toward his return over and over again. Over 300 separate references in the New Testament to Christ's return. And when he returns, he says he will make all things new. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. He who was seated on the throne, we'll talk about that in a little bit, I am making, says I, will make, I am making all things new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's why we have the book of Revelation. Fourth, and finally, therefore, based on these three sentences, we as his followers are to endure in faith and hope. In short, the entire book of Revelation, I think, could be summarized as Jesus sending this message to his followers throughout the centuries. I'm coming soon, hang on. I'm coming soon, hang on.
In fact, the next to last verse of the entire Bible, Revelation 21, verse 20, says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Okay, John, Apostle John, the author, is writing toward the end of the very first century, roughly 90 A.D. or so. At that time, the first generation of Christians uh, is beginning to pass on, beginning to die off. And plus, they're enduring intense persecution under the violent and oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. In particular, the emperor named Domitian. If you know anything about ancient history, Domitian was the first Roman emperor to give himself the title God and Lord. Okay? He was the first one to identify himself as God. Pliny, um, who was a, a Roman historian, calls, refers to Domitian as the beast from hell. Okay? Pliny was not a Christian, but he referred to Domitian as the beast from hell. He was such a violent man. Now, the center of the Christian movement at that time was in what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor. So the whole book of Revelation begins in the first two chapters with seven letters that Jesus sort of dictates to John to give to the major churches in Asia Minor and their letters of encouragement, commendation, and in some cases, correction. And if you read those letters, they're still relevant to the church today. And the rest of the vision in the book of Revelation points to Jesus' promised return in various ways. Now, the book is full of strange images, uh, fantastic events, all of which I think are to help us understand two things, who Jesus is and what he's going to do. Now, in these four weeks of this series, we're going to talk about four images of Jesus. We're not going to cover the whole book of Revelation, but four images that tell us something about Jesus. Warrior, lamb, judge, and bridegroom. And today we're going to start by talking about Jesus, the warrior. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. You can look on the screens or, of course, in your own Bible. Let me read this short passage to you. John is writing. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, there are at least eight symbolic apocalyptic images in this one vision that John gives us, so we're going to look at all eight of them quickly uh, today and see what we learn about Jesus. John says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The first thing he says is, Jesus is the rider on the white horse. Let me explain. Great leaders throughout history have often had themselves pictured riding on white stallions. For example, Napoleon. Images of Napoleon riding on a white stallion. George Washington himself riding on a white horse. Even some pastors. <laughs> I'm really getting into this sort of Photoshop thing, you know. <laughs> Couldn't resist. At the time of the Roman Empire, there was a tradition called the triumphal procession. Now, that was when a, a, a triumphant Roman general won a significant battle out in the battlefield, and he came back to Rome, and he paraded through the central streets of Rome on a white stallion or pulled by four white horses and a chariot, and behind him would be the, the entire captured army of slaves and all the loot he dragged out of that country or that city. It was called the Triumphal Procession. Everyone reading this text would re immediately recognize the significance of the white horse. It was a symbol of triumph and victory. Now, this is in sharp contrast to Jesus' first coming, right? We called it the incarnation. We celebrate at Christmas time. And Jesus' first coming was in great humility, right? Born in a small, out-of-the-way village called Bethlehem, put into an animal feeding trough, a manger, because there's no room for them in the inn, lived 30 years of his life in virtual anonymity in a backwater town called Nazareth, and then three years 
uh, into his public ministry. He rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey on what we call Palm Sunday, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah, saying, Behold, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey. Jesus' first coming was clothed in humility because he was coming as a suffering servant, the Bible says, who would offer himself as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. And he was rejected as Messiah for that very reason, because he was, they wanted him to come as a military conquering hero, but he didn't, not the first time. But the book of Revelation reveals to us in this image that the next time he comes, he'll come in awesome power and unmistakable authority. He'll come as a triumphant and conquering king. Now remember the situation. The first generation of Christians is dying off. The whole world seems filled with violence and evil. Imagine how encouraging this vision, this image would be to those under such oppressive rule as the power of Rome. Now let's talk a bit about the writer of that white horse. John goes on to say, secondly, he is called faithful and true. Faithful and true stands in sharp contrast to the images we see in the book of Revelation about a character called the beast. In Revelation 13, John writes, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. Verse 6, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy pe people and to conquer them. Who do you think he's referring to now in coded language? Remember Domitian called himself God and Lord, sought to destroy the church. Many scholars think he's referring in coded language to, to Domitian, the emperor, in a way he couldn't say in straightforward language. And it, was given, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Now, scholars believe he may have been using the, the figure of the beast to talk about Domitian. Others think he's talking about the ultimate enemy of Christ, Satan himself. The rider on the white horse, on the other hand, is the one who is faithful and true. Faithful and true to what? Faithful and true, I think, to God himself. Going to Hebrews chapter 1, we're looking at a lot of scripture tonight. Hebrews chapter 1, Paul writes, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the one who is faithful and true. Faithful and true to the nature and character of God. Faithful and true to his own promises. Promises to forgive Promises to bring new life. Promise to make all things new. All these promises summarized in just two verses in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, the one who is faithful and true. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. That's what the beast does but to save the world through him. So where the beast terrorizes the world with blasphemies and destruction, the rider on the white horse brings faithfulness and truth. Third, John writes, he has eyes like flames of fire. What's that mean? Well, the meaning of eyes in Scripture is often about wisdom and knowledge. Fire is often the image of holiness and purity. So we can summarize by saying that the eyes of flaming fire are like combination of holiness and wisdom and judgment. So the writer is perfect in holiness, perfect in knowledge, perfect in judgment. Years ago, my family and I were traveling in Africa, and we had a chance to meet a young man who ha had grown up as a Maasai tribesman. Now, the Maasai are one of the oldest continuous tribes on the face of the earth in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and he was now a Christian. And uh, I asked him briefly his story. He, t he talked for about 45 minutes. And one of the stories he told was before he even had seen a Bible, before he had heard the stories of Jesus, he had a series of dreams. And one of his dreams that he had over and over again is that he was being followed by a light. 
a light from the heavens. And the light was so bright and so intense and so pure, he would try to run from it in his dream. He would try to hide from the light, but he couldn't hide anywhere. If he went into his home, it came right through into his bedroom. If he tried to hide under his bed, it penetrated the bed. If he tried to dig in the ground in a hole, it came right through the hole. He couldn't escape the light. Then he was introduced to the Bible. And he saw Jesus describe himself as the light of the world. He read images like the one with eyes like blazing fire, and he realized the one chasing him, the one pursuing him, was the purity and holiness of Christ himself, seeking to call him to repentance, and he did. The one with eyes like flames of fire. Fourth, he has many crowns. John says his eyes are like flames of fire, and on his head are many diadems. We don't use that word now, but diadem is a crown. So the rider in a white horse is wearing many crowns crowns. Interestingly, historians tell us that in those days, rulers who claimed authority over multiple entities, nations or city-states, would wear more than one crown. Uh, so many diadems indicates the rider on the white horse has vast authority and rule. The crown image also makes me think of the crown of thorns woven together and placed on Jesus' head at his crucifixion, placed there to mock him, remember? To mock him as king. The crowns of Revelation tell us Jesus, when we see him again, will be the king, sovereign over all the universe. Paul in Colossians writes this soaring passage in chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And down to verse 18. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Why? Because he wears many crowns. He is sovereign over all the universe. So clearly, Jesus is being pictured here, imaged in these images as king, as a king who will return to take all that belongs to him rightfully in power and glory. But what kind of king is he? John then says in verse 13, the fifth thing, he, same one, rider on the white horse, is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now this is a dead giveaway. In Revelation chapter 5, which you'll hear Jeff preach about next week, uh, we read this verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. It seems clear to me that the robe being worn by the rider on the white horse, dipped in blood, has been dipped in the blood of the lamb. Who is the Lamb? 1 Peter chapter 1 says, For you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a Lamb without blemish or defect. So, the rider on the white horse comes not to shed the blood of others. He's already shed his own blood for the salvation of the world. He's the antithesis of of the beast, of the Roman emperor, of Satan himself, who comes to destroy, steal, and to kill. But the rider on the white horse comes to bring life and salvation and redemption, and this is the heart of the gospel. The Jesus that was on the cross is the Jesus on the white horse. The glorious king is clothed in the robe that's, that's soaked in the blood of the lamb. Sixth, we're told he has a name. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Actually, in this one passage, we see four names. Faithful and true, a name no one knows. That's the mystery of God. The Word of God is another name. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Christ. And finally, the ultimate name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, two things come to mind here. Maybe you've already thought of them. One is the sign tacked up over Jesus' head on the cross that said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The formal charge that brought Jesus the death penalty was treason, claiming to be a king when only Caesar could be hailed as king. See the, see the connection? 
He was killed for the very thing that he will actually reveal himself to be, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then we also think of Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, in his first coming. Therefore, as God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's in his second coming. Both are here in one passage. So, the rider in the white horse is Jesus himself, returning in great power and holiness and clothed in the salvation only the Lamb can provide. So, that's Something about who Jesus is. We have other images to cover in this series. But what will he do? The seventh thing we see in this passage is he will bring a sword. It says he will bring a sword. From his mouth comes a sharp sword from which, with which to strike down the nations. Now this seems to be a bit um, of a weird image at first. You have a, a sharp sword coming out of the writer's mouth. Who carries a sword in their mouth, right? The word translated sword here uh, refers to a long, a spear-like sword that was used in war in that time. It was used in a piercing sort of action, not a slashing action, but piercing. And the sword comes from the writer's mouth. Does all, all that conjure up anything for you? Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 4. Again, the words of the Apostle Paul. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight. Remember the eyes? But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The sword is the word of God. So Jesus is coming again as king. He is the lamb that was slain, yet he's coming to rule. How will he rule? With what will he rule? He will reign through the truth of the gospel, the truth of his word. He rules not with the power of the beast, not with political and military power, but with the power of truth, with the power of self-sacrifice, with the power of the cross is how this king will rule. But there's still something else here. Then I saw heaven opened. and Behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. That's the final and eighth thing I need to cover. He judges and makes war. Now, judging and making war don't sound very nice. And we're used to thinking of Jesus as being sort of the ultimate nice guy, right? Nice. We have to ask, what kind of war, what kind of judgment are we talking about? Now, there's a lot of debate by scholars about the book of Revelation, by people of different theological stripes. Some see these images as entirely symbolic and spiritual. Others see them as pointing toward a literal and very bloody war at the end of all things called Armageddon. Some think it's a combination of both. We're going to see all this in greater detail in the messages later on in, on Jesus as judge. But the image of here is one who will come to judge all sin and evil. Now, think just for a moment as we wrap this up about all the injustice and violence and evil we see around us. Mass shootings, children bought and sold as sex slaves, terrorist groups celebrating the murder of innocent people. Think about the suffering in the world. It just seems... That just seems wrong. Children in pediatric cancer wards. Cancer itself just seems wrong. One of the popular arguments against the existence of God is the very existence of evil and suffering in the world. The argument goes like this. How can there be a loving and all-powerful God when such evil and suffering exist? How could a loving and all-powerful God allow such suffering and wrong in the world without doing something about it? It's one of the most popular arguments out there today. You probably have friends that have said that to you. In a book called Cold Case Christianity, the author J. Warner Wallace argues that such questions are understandable, but they come from too limited a perspective. If there is a God, and if that God inhabits eternity, and if every human being possesses an eternal soul, then to say that God has not addressed the problem of evil is premature. He just hasn't addressed it yet. Revelation tells us that the time of judgment is coming. 
When Jesus returns, he brings perfect justice and perfect judgment will utterly destroy his great enemy as well as right every wrong. Now, how will this happen? That's a great mystery. But let me tell you what I think. It's just me. I think it happens through his holiness, through his righteousness. Throughout the Bible, you look at the Old Testament, you find that God's holiness and his righteousness is salvation to those who accept it and it's destruction for those who reject it. His holiness is always the same. It's like electricity. It's always the same. But if I approach it prepared on its terms, it's, it's powerful and useful. Salvation. If I approach it frivolously on my own terms, it's destruction. Judgment is in the form of God's Jesus' great holiness. Now, what does all this mean to us? Let me kind of try to bring it down. First, when we look at the world and see all the evil and suffering, and, and we live in, in one of the most uh, comfortable places on earth. Most people don't live like we do. But when we look at all the evil and suffering in the world, we can know it's not going to go on forever. Jesus is going to put an end to it all. He promises. He's going to make all things right. He's going to make all things new. Secondly, when we face persecution or ridicule, again, we don't face it often in our culture. One of our pastors in Turkey right now emailed us this week. Pastor Ali, who's been here to preach, a church that he helped start right down the road, has been, has been bombed within a few blocks, and they are spreading all kinds of, of evil rumors about that church because they want someone to destroy it. He's under intense persecution right now. When we face that, Jesus shows us what weapons we are to use. Not the weapons of the beast, not political power, not violence, but the weapons are what? The blood of the lamb and the sword, the word of God, the, the truth of the gospel. Those are the weapons. Finally, thirdly, the great question is not the one everyone wants to ask, when is the world going to end? That's not the question. Uh, I can say, but the question is, where do I stand with Jesus? I can tell you with great uncertainty. I, I can't tell you when the world's going to end. I don't know. I can tell you with great certainty that my world is going to end within the next 40 years or so, give or take. That would be, might be quite generous. For some of you it's less, for some of you it's more. But our, we're all, our, all our worlds are going to end within one generation. I don't know how long the whole world's going to last, but that doesn't really matter, does it? The question is, when's your world going to end? When's mine going to end? And am I prepared to meet my king on that day? Revelation says Jesus is coming, coming like a warrior who claims victory. And on that day, there are going to be two groups of people, only two. Those who receive, surrender to, and worship that king, and those who do not. Only two groups. That's what the whole book of Revelation says. Hang on. I'm coming soon. The question is, where do you stand? Let me bow in prayer as we close. Lord, thank you for your word tonight. It's full of so much stuff. We, have to, we can hardly wrap our minds around the truth that's there. But thank you for the great hope that is in this book we call Revelation. Thank you for this glimpse into the end of the story, that you are coming back, that you promise, that you are our king, that you will have the final word that you will make all things new. And may we surrender to you as king today so that we might reign with you on that day. We give you our praise and our worship tonight. In Jesus' name we pray.